I mean, a sort of applied mathematician. Uh, and uh, I was raised in that kind of crowd that Ran was talking about, Yossi Clafton, uh, not by Yossi, but other people. So it was some sort of development of theory of transport, not in biology really, but it was uh, the interface of chemistry and physics. So organic crystal and so on, you know, charges moving across semiconductors and so on. So, so that's my background. And then eventually, uh, for the turn of events, moved me to the ecology department at Princeton with Simon. And so I got so much enthusiastic about understanding biology, so I decided to dedicate my life to help biologists understand biology. Is Good it right? I mean, I don't <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, um, and now I'm in Bristol, and, but uh, I try to help biologists, let's say, OK? <laughs> so, um, uh, so what I'm interested in general, I mean, if, if I just uh, don't talk about biology, but I'm interested in the connection between microscopic and macroscopic processes. So given the patterns that you observe a certain large scale, could be time or, or space, then you would like to understand the micro mechanisms that generate this process. So this is, you know, if you want, it's complexity sciences, if you want to just give a different name. Uh, but very much biology is a complex system where a, la a lot of scales uh, and processes at different scales which interact among each other. I mean, we have heard Ran talking about maybe in different kind of language, but that's what happens. So um, what I'm going to tell you today is, uh, I just draw uh, this again, that you've seen from Ran. So uh, it's, uh, it's about developing some sort of theory which connects, if you want, this to and a bit of this optimality. Even I won't talk too much about that. So, so an object which sits somewhere here. And it's about uh, from it, formation of territories. Hmm? So it's a very general process. And I'll focus, you see, on sand marking animals. Anyway. OK, let me start. Um, so let me just thank my collaborators for what I'm going to tell you today. So Jonathan Potts is a complexity student. He's now is essentially finished. He submitted the thesis. And he was co-supervised by myself and Stephen Harris. He's a biologist who knows a lot about foxes. And he has this fantastic data set of 30 years of foxes in Bristol, which we actually, with which we tested the model. So it was great. Um, so before I actually go into uh, the details, uh, let me just tell you the motivation, which was some years back. Uh, and actually, this was just before going to Princeton. I was given some data and about some um, rodents in, in Arizona. And what I was, you know, one of the things that as a physicist, if you want, you tend to plot is, uh, I mean, you plot things that change over time. And what you tend to plot is the average area they occupy. So I mean, you, you, you'll hear from me uh, many times this term mean square displacement. Essentially, it's, it's a dist the average distance square that they travel. Eh? And so I remember when those data, actually, yeah, I mean, I can just plot it. There, they were given this, this data. And uh, so this, is a, this, this mean square displacement is the average. So you'll know everything about, at the end of this course, about mean square displacement, how to take it out from the data. And you plot, so essentially think, think about the area they occupy, in some sense, at the moment, versus time. And this you see, it's number of days here. And I mean, the data where, I mean, this is just the step of uh, one day. You know, the first data point is one day. And uh, what was very intriguing for me to see this is that if you think about an animal which is confined somehow, if you plot that quantity in, in a confined space, then, well, here this dependence, the shape of this depends on the statistics of the movement. But eventually, what happens is that it saturates a long time. If you are really in a confined space, there is no, no other way. Either you are leaking out of that space, so the barriers are not really reflective, or, this is the other, or the actual box that contains your, you, the you anima, is actually moving. So if you don't want to get this saturation, you actually have a box where you are confined, which is actually moving. And so what you're picking up as you look at data is that this moving of the box, or you're actually looking at animals that actually escape somehow. So when I was given this data, I was, um, I was playing with models that actually do actually have this kind of behavior. Huh? 
And when Jim Brown gave me this data, I told him, ah, oh, these are the wrong data, OK, of course. <laughs> so but then I, I let it there. So I sit with this for a few days. Then I said, OK, I, I don't understand a thing about what's happening here. So eventually, when I moved to Bristol, I knew someone who knows, I mean, Stephen Harris I mean, is a colleague, and he knows a lot about territorial behavior. So I said, I mean, I just you know, decided to talk to him and, uh, and try to understand what is it that they do, this animal, and then you hear now. And so, uh, so eventually, from the mathematical point of view, I went about creating models that provide this kind of shape in the mean square displacement. Okay, so this is a motivation. And so now I'm going to tell you about territorial animals. Maybe you know everything about it, but so I'll tell you about the biological introduction. Allow me. So then I'll tell you about the model, and which of course involves movement and interaction. Uh, so a lot of times you've heard from Ryan as well. So if you actually have data and you have this super stochastic simulation, which you have to wait, you know, a month to get an output, then then it not, it's not very convenient. So you you need to have a re reduction of this complicated model to something that you can use easy with data. So this is the purpose of this analytic calculation. Well, there is a one dimension. I'll tell you about the one dimension, but we have done the two dimension, of course. Otherwise, it would not make much sense. Then uh, I think I'll have time to tell you a bit about the non-Branian aspect of this animal, which in the, that context will be correlated random walk. And then I'll tell you eventually, uh, this was why the biologist was interested, Stephen Harris, is that to look at this fox population data. So this is the, now the set of animals. Uh, during this, actually before and after this mange episodic, which is a sort of scabby disease. So this animal eventually were decimated in Bristol during the 90s. Uh, and so, and then I'll tell you about some conclusion. So this is a plan. <coughs> well, everybody probably knows in this audience what animal territoriality means, but let me just uh, maybe re-emphasize it. It's a result of a, it's a broadcasting mechanism where you want to broadcast the pre your presence to others. So it's broadcast. So whoever comes nearby would have to understand that that area is claimed by yourself. Hmm? So this is, and then what they use, I mean, they use different methods, if you want. And so our auditory, visual, and olfactory signals, these are the most common. And so we'll focus on uh, <coughs> the olfactory one. We will tell you about foxes. Huh? So these are clearly the other examples. Hmm? So, and what I, I, I hope I'll convince you, what is territoriality? It's a form of collective movement where the territories keep moving and changing shape. This is the box motivation that I was telling you is going around. Huh? So, and this is a result of the interaction and the movement of the animal. So this is a micro to micro connection. If you have these patterns of mean square displacement that keeps increasing over time, and then you want to understand exactly how it's generated by the single individuals. So this is what is happening here. So now, just the background on what are the questions that people ask. So and uh, this is probably what you always see: why, who, how, and when, and where. No? So and uh, so the why. These are the optimality questions. So this is typically why do they do it? Well, they want to uh, ensure access to resources and mates. And, uh, and in some cases, it represents a social status. So that's why you want to have maybe a bigger territory. The how, which is what I'll focus on, it's uh, the mechanisms to which you create these territories and you maintain them. So, and well, the when and where, you probably, well, do you know the difference between a home range and a territory? So the territory is something that you actually defend. I mean, defend means that you ensure that nobody gets in. So it's a sort of a exclusive core area. But then you can have a home range, which is areas, which is still a confined space where you actually venture into, but you share with others in some sense. Or you may share or not. But so, so the when and where is a classical question in that context that it's how you actually go and measure. You know, remember that you measure some land scale, which is, for example, the size of the territory or the size of the home range, and then you need a ruler. And so there are all these complications when you have a ruler and you try to measure, I mean, something which has a size, you have to deal with this kind of uh, issues. Huh? So, I mean, we've not talked at all about these things, but uh, so it's just a question of what is convenient to do when you want to measure this quantity. 
So as I said, the why are this optimality question, and these are the animal interaction question, which I'll tell you a lot. And I tend to define this when and where, this home range question. Uh, because remember, when you go and track animals, you're not going really with a ruler, as I said, and you have a size to measure because you are, the animal is moving. Eh? So you're integrating over time. So that's why things get complicated. Eh? So but anyway, we'll focus on the animal interaction question. <coughs> so and uh, let me, uh, so you know, uh, in mathematics or in physics, you know, the word is nonlinear, so it means things interact. Mm? So if you want to be right and, you know, trying to explain biology, you have to get the fundamental aspect, which is the interaction right. Mm? So if you are a mathematician and you want to just invent models that represent biology, forget. So you really have to talk to the biologists, especially experimental biologists, which are in the field, and they know exactly how things go. So the key point in this study was to understand what is the meaning of the interaction in the concept of territoriality. So, and so what are these aspects? It is, there is a sand marking process. There is an aspect of the defense, I mean, which in some cases involves chasing out, but you'll see that is not the key part. And then there is the avoidance. So this is a response when you find a foreign scent. Eh? So animals, they tend to avoid each other because they could be very costly, the confrontation. And that was the case in foxes, you know, they, could, they could be crippled for life, so it's not very convenient. So it's better to know where are the others and you stay where you are, where you want to be. Hmm? So, so how do you, so when you talk about interactions, how, so how does it happen? So you have a process which is a sand deposition. Then you have <coughs> the important aspect, uh, which you'll see, it depends, you know, that shape of the mean square displacement, which is you know, up or down, you know, if it saturates or not. That depends all about how this, the sand, so remain active on the terrain. So that's the scent. It's important to say it's a short-term queue. And then there is the aspect that if you want to maintain the territory, you have to go back and renew the scent. After some times, you know, I mean, the environment is such that, you know, it's gone. So if a neighbor comes and he doesn't smell your scent there, so then he just assume that nobody's claiming the ter that part of the the territory, that part of the space, and so he will just claim it from itself just by sending. So if you want to maintain your territory, you have to go out and resend that specific area. Hmm? And then, if you want, there is an actual retreat after encountering foreign scent. So which is this is a conspecific avoidance. Huh? So uh, so this interaction, as you can see, I mean, you know, if you actually try to write um, to to create the models for that. It has to have all that included, a real model. Eh? So you can, if you just put population density and you just multiply population one, y1, population one, y2, and you make your nonlinearity there, it doesn't make any sense. You really have to actually include all of that. So this is what I called the sand mediated interaction. So notice that it involves a lot of things and deposition, a renewal, and then a retreat. So there is, in that interaction, there is a movement involved. You move, you send, and then you find the foreign one, and you go back. Hmm? So um, just to tell you what has been studied so far in the concept of neighbor interaction. So there is a nice, well, this started in 93. Jim Murray, probably some of you might know, there's two volumes of mathematical biology he's written over the years. And then Mark Lewis was one of his former students, and they write what they did, they coupled, I mean, it was not really a collective kind of movement model. There were just two individuals. And their scent profile that they were depositing was coupled with their, the way they were moving. But the key difference is that this was the reaction diffusion type of model. Who knows what the reaction diffusion type of models are? Have you heard? Uh, also, you shouldn't tell me. but. <laughs> uh, so, OK, so maybe since I'm not going to use reaction diffusion time, so uh, I'll tell you later exactly. Uh, so anyway, then they, they, they wrote a, a series of papers, I mean, looking at um, wolves and coyotes. And in 2006, I've written uh, a nice book uh, about mechanistic home ranges. Now, what we have done is, so in some sense, we went beyond this book because we really went in and tried to take into account the discreteness of the interaction event. 
If you use a reaction diffusion model the way they've done it, you just talk about a density profile of the, of the scent. And it typically is, is not going to allow you to give an answer, a correct answer, if that profile goes to zero. Now, if the scent suddenly disappears, that really goes to zero. Eh? So forget about using reaction diffusion model. You can't really. I mean, this is, by default, is going to give you the results, which have nothing to do with the actual scent going to zero. So if you, if you believe that the scent really goes to zero, you should not use a reaction diffusion model. Eh? So, so that's what I'm saying. We went beyond that, uh, that kind of work. And the other aspect, which is important here, and this is why it makes it a collective kind of model, is that they use a focal point. So they worry about, if you want, central place forager. I mean, foxes, for example, are not. So if you have a place where you nest, where you tend to go back to, then you can actually try to approximate uh, and maybe use you know, Murkoff and Lewis model. Now, if you are not in that situation, then you have to forget about a focal point attraction. And then you really become a collective aspect. Hmm? And that's why the box is actually moving around, which is your territories and so on. Hmm? So, so what they didn't account for, the discreteness of the animals and therefore the interaction when they encounter foreign scent. And, uh, and if we want, I mean, the focal point attraction, it's, it's another aspect. Hmm? OK, so the model. Hmm? So, well, you probably know that when you don't know exactly how animals move, we just assume that they are random. They move at random. And so we had our random walkers, our beloved random walkers we had to use. I mean, we change a bit later on the thing. So that's what we assume. Uh, oh, by the way, this is, I know it's kind of a seminar, the first lecture, but I just told yesterday, Ran, that if all of you has to at least make one or two questions to the entire course, and if you don't, we'll be, you'll be whipped, OK? So, so please. I mean, uh, try to do it. Otherwise, in, even in this context, which is a seminar kind of, just stop me eh, if you don't understand. Eh? Because I'll try to. So at the end of, the, of this course, whatever you have seen here in the first lecture, you'll be able to actually reproduce. Well, maybe the simulation are complicated. But you know, the others, the rest of the stuff, you'll be able to reproduce. This is, this is a, my purpose. Eh? So, so, and so as I said, so the animals deposit scent as they move. And the way we have done it, uh, well, if you want, we were focused on foxes. So these are the so-called hinterland markers. They deposit scent wherever they go. In fact, whenever they capture a fox, there is no blood, the, uh, there is no urine in that they find the fox because they keep, you know, scenting or every time they move somewhere. Hmm? So the other case is the borderland markers, which they tend to scent only the boundaries of their territory. Um, so this is a key part, which is a scent decays within a given time. You will see this symbol. T A S is for active scent, the T is the time. And, <coughs> and this is the reaction as they find a foreign scent. Uh, I mean you can relax that assumption. And these are exciting results that are coming out. But I, I this is about the why question that I won't tell you because I haven't finished studying it. But so but uh, you assume now in this context that you actually find a foreign scent and you re retreat. So we have to give a name, but it's not so much fantasy in creating this name, so territorial random walker. Hmm? So this, we have used this territorial random walk model. Now, um, <coughs> to give you a snapshot, so imagine uh, you're doing this simulation. If you want, you can do it. Well, it's a lattice space. And it could do discrete time or, the, or, or continuous time. It doesn't matter that much. But um, so imagine now I'm just plotting uh, two neighbors and there is this is the blue animal this is a red animal and suppose there is a next step in your simulation you're updating your simulation and what you do this one it can equally likely go to any of these four spots so it's a it's a random walker huh? and on the other hand this one which has just come at the boundary with the others is not allowed to go in here or there so as it comes here, given there is an active scent, here there is no active scent because there is nothing. Here there is. He's in principle allowed position to go next, are just reduced to two because here it cannot. So this is, remember, so notice there is 
come here, there is a reaction, or conspecific avoidance in this case, that you have to go away from the Forensen. So you cannot, you're forced to take a step which is away from the foreign territory. So far all clear? <coughs> eh, so this one, it just happened that here, nine, neither of the two animals have been here within the past TAS time steps. Hmm? If it's discrete time step or you know, continuous TAS time. So what happens, therefore, now notice that there is already there is a, an, an interaction which is microscopic, which is at the level of the individual. Whenever they encounter a foreign scent, they retreat. And then automatically what it generates, it's an exclusion. Exclusion is clear now. Uh, between the territories. So there is, a I mean, in physics, you know, there is an exclusion process. People have studied since the 60s. There's a lot of interesting statistical properties about excluding particles. So in this case, the excluding particles are not just you know, point particles. They just have a size, which is also changing. Because you know, if the animal doesn't keep coming back here, then this suddenly will disappear. So the boundaries now has a different shape. Huh? So it's an exclusion process at the level of territory. But it's complicated by the fact that the shape is not of the particles, which are the territory, are not the same. And they keep changing over time and out of the microscopic evolution of the various individuals. So that's, you see, it's a very collective kind of process. Hmm. So now I um, <coughs> haven't defined you the territory. No, so what is a territory? Well, you have to define it. Huh? Otherwise, we get in trouble. And so it's very simply, it's, you know, given a time t, a territory is all the set of special locations where the scent is active for a given animal. Hmm? So if you want, I mean, this is more mathematically or perfect. There is a <laughs> so it's a, if the animal, I mean, all the set, so uh, all the set of location where the animal is wander in this time interval, t minus tas in the past, t. Hmm? Now, show, let me show you a movie. Uh, so you can already imagine, get the feel, even before showing. Now you're going to have a set of animals. And uh, depending on the active scent time, if you make a very long TAS, then nothing is going to move. I mean, in principle, if it's infinite, then everything is static. Eh? So I'm going to show you two little movies where active scent time is slow. I mean, active scent time is, is long. Therefore, you have a slow dynamics. And then after some time, it's is, is a short, it's a small value, and you have a, you have a fast, fast dynamics. So what you have there, it's, OK, there are initial conditions you have to put in this simulation. Let me not bother you with that. You wait some time. And, uh, and then you have each color is a different animal. Well, sorry, each color is a different scent profile for a, diff from a, for a different animal. And where you see white here, it means that within the past TAS time steps, none of these animals have been there. And so you clearly you can see that in order for a territory to move, what has to happen is that the neighbor, if they are, I mean, they are contiguous, they have to not to renew that part of the territory. So that becomes smaller. And then this one, eventually this animal here, will go and encounter those free available space. And that territory now becomes larger on, in that side. Hmm. So um, now there is some sort of a transient initially. So let me move away from here. So they kind of tend to go more or less to a roundish shape after some time. And they keep moving, as you would expect. So this is a slow territory dynamics. So you have a lactic scent time, which is sufficiently large. Now, what I'm sampling here, the simulation is uh, uh, at the time of the active scent time. If you sample for shorter, you see nothing, and nothing happens. Eh? So you have to at least sample it. Now, uh, what we haven't studied yet is, I mean, there is a sort of jamming here. I mean, you, in principle, you would expect this over time to move all over, but it takes a very long time. So you know, I don't know if you know, if you know glass transition and so on. There is probably some similarity to this glass transition. So there is eventually a moment, as the active scent times is sufficiently large, then it doesn't have to be infinite that these things kind of get static. They can't, you know, 
they have the ability to squeeze in between two to move, but probably up to a point. So we haven't studied that they part. They will become hexagonal. They will become? Hexagonal. Hexagonal. Uh, I, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I can't say. So that is the part we haven't studied so far, which is an interesting biological question. I mean, you don't, know, of course, need Nazi and time, which is infinite. But if you want, up to there, there's going to be a phase transition here for sure. I mean, if it's in the, in the language of physics. But so, but if I show you the other movie, if you want, um, is where maybe it's not too biological. This one, you see lots of whites, and you know, there's I've just reduced by half the active same time here, and the sampling is the same. And then there is an exponential sensitivity on this active same time, so I'll show you why. But um, so this is probably not really biological, but of course, you know, you can tune your active same time and see you know, things change. But this is just to show you that the model, I mean, can provide this kind of dynamics. Uh, and you see, clearly, you can see a lot of white spaces even inside their territories because they're not, they don't have enough time to resent wherever they've been. So uh, just one word about, I said that I'm not going to tell you about home ranges, but just one word about that. If you take this kind of model, and there is a reason why I'm going to tell you, is that, and you follow the animal. Now, so far, I've just shown you the scent. There was an animal inside each of these territories, but just not I mean, to simplify the visual aspect of it. So, but now, I mean, the real biologists, what they do, they actually go out, forget about measuring scent. Eh? <laughs> it's very difficult, although, although people are thinking about it. But the main point is that you follow the animal. You may assume that it's scenting, or you know that it's scenting, and so on. And so the data that you have is actually where the animal have been. So, and typically what you do, you generate, well, you, you use minimum convex polygon, you do all sorts of things. Or the typical thing is that utilization distribution. Do you all know what a utilization distribution is? No, okay, so you have spatial locations and you put a frequency of appearance of each of the animals in that specific location. So essentially, if you have a probability of the stochastic process going on, which is this one, you integrate that over time. Because you keep tracking where they go. So if we take those simulation and we integrate over time, what you get, you get your home ranges. Hmm? Um, so, so why I'm showing you this, even if you're not going to talk about home ranges, is that notice that initially I haven't put any heterogeneity in the environment. This is only generated by the interaction. Hmm? So, um, so this heterogeneity is, is endogenous generated. Of course, resources are very important. But if you, if you think about that this might represent real data, which they, I mean, we can discuss about, uh, then have we forgotten about talking about interaction with animals? when we try to plot utilization distribution, because this is what you see. This is from the model. Eh? So now notice that you can have, it just because of the initial condition and the type of interaction, you can have areas here where very animals go there a few times. It just happens. Now imag imagine if you wait long enough, these things eventually move. Eh? So remember, you're integrating with time. And, and, and there are, you know, this one, for example, it just happens, you know, all the animals are equal in the way in the model, but this is squeezed between larger ones. It yes, please. What time span do you have to integrate over on the scale of TAS? Oh, this one. Uh, hundreds, hundreds, 500, yeah, of the order, at least 500, let's say. 500 of, you know, a few thousand times. Well, yeah, if you keep integrating longer, eventually things will you'll go anywhere in some sense, unless the TAS is so large that everything is kind of stuck. Yeah, but on the scale of TAS, it's hundreds of on a, on a reasonable scale of TAS, it's not too large. Mm -hmm. Where things are kind of moving, that's what you get. Which depends on your sampling uh, frequency also. No, no, that's the movie. It depends on sampling frequency. This one has no sampling frequency. This you are integrating the time. So the movie is just, I mean, in order to show you, I needed to pick at sampling frequency, but this one. Hmm? 
Yeah, now when I told you about the 1D model, you'll see that this is exactly, I'm going to answer you, like, precisely the question. If you wait long enough and the animal are not really confined, they can kind of go around because these boxes keep moving their territories, then eventually you go all over. And so that's why, you know, typical questions that, you know, what is the home range size? But if you don't specify for how long you have measured that home range, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, I mean, I'm glad that you say like this, but you know. <laughs> so, it, so typically, when you read some papers in ecology, you say, "Oh, home range of that animal." Well, of course, they tell you the environment and so on. But then, for how long are they measured? I mean, you don't know. So this is an important. I mean, here you can see clearly is important. Now, if you have, if if you want, there is a focal point. Maybe it's not that important. But if the animals are allowed to actually change and move around the nest position, that becomes important. Mm -hmm. Did I answer your question? Yeah. OK, so this is just I wanted to tell you that uh, for me, it's fascinating that everything is generated by just the stochasticity of the system. No quench, what they call in physics, there is no quench disorder. So we haven't put some uh, resources patchy distribution there. Mm -hmm. Of course, you know, if you put resources then uh, there is a whole set of questions that you can ask. But even without it, then you can see that you have data uh, that comes out of the simulation, which might very well represent real data. So this is a side statement, if you want. OK, so just to reemphasize what you've done so far, is that we have annual movement and interaction, which generate an exclusion process of the territory. And now for those who learn maybe not this crowd about the exclusion process, that when, when you look at long time dependencies of the mean square displacement, which remember my motivation was that mean square displacement, which was actually not saturating, but was keeping increasing. So that has specific time dependence. In 1D square root of time, in 2D is sub, slightly subdiffusive. And, and so this is what you try to that's a macroscopic feature that you can look at if you have such kind of model. Huh? So, and if you have a mean square displacement that is not linear in time, this is what is called anomalous diffusion. And this is what happens. So as you actually consider the entire interaction and the movement of the territory and the animal where they go, and then eventually along times this animal, you will see, even if they are random walkers, they will subdiffuse because of this exclusion of the territory. Yeah, so very good. So if I plot the mean square displacement of uh, a, an object which is diffusing, if I put MSD, that's linear, always, I mean, if you're un un unconstrained motion. And then if it's subdiffusing, yeah, you have a, this is something which is MSD, yeah, but let me just, it, this is proportional to t to some power alpha, where alpha is less than 1. A simple definition. So when alpha is less than 1, you have a subdiffusion. And if you want, this is the, I mean, the area of uh, Levy walk, if you want. If you have something which is super diffusing, so this is actually proportional to t to some beta, which is larger than 1. Uh, so, um, so the subdiffusion here is because you have this exclusion. Uh, so these territories, the actual box, as I call it, that keeps moving. But you know, it's a, it's a slow motion. It's a very slow motion. And that's why you get this t to the alpha. It's also beta, right? Huh? It's also beta here and there. Oh, what, what do you say? It's also beta, the exponent. It's better? No, no, the exponent is better. Like, like the one above. Oh, yeah, yeah. I just put it. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's just a name. So they will not be confused that this Oh, no, it's just a name. Sorry, sorry. It's just beta. It has, it's a numerical value. Sorry. Yeah, good, good. Run. So it's a numerical value. Sorry. Hmm. So, um, okay, so this is. Any other question on this? About the, the simulation. The, the, there was a boundary to the simulation, or was it? No, no, it's, it's, peri it's periodic boundary condition. So, so the initial condition, they were all dispersed uh, evenly? Yeah, so the, the initial condition eventually, the initial condition is no scent anywhere, and you put them, uh, uh, was it randomly? No, I mean, I think they, I mean, this is a grid. So you put them like this, but then you start waiting a long time. And so even if this one is a, is a reticulum, if you want, there is a geometry, I mean, the specific, but after some time, these are random workers. So you just forget everything. 
You just wait for the scent to have a certain profile, which is what you would expect. No? And you, know, you would expect the profile, which is given in 1D, you wanted to have some sort of profile, which is, you know, it's, you have been, it's more likely that you have been in the center rather than in you know, the borders. And so if you, the same profile is this one, where this uh, represent the um, uh, time to decay of the scent. So here, probably, you are more or less in the center. And so here, you, you don't need too much time to decay. So it's a pre I mean, at the moment, it's a presence absence. But still, there is the information, how long ago have you deposited the scent there? So there, the, the movie that I showed you were presence absence. So there, I mean, there was information, but the idea wasn't showing to you. But this, of course, is it's very, as they say, no Markovian. No? So it has a, has a memory in it, the whole thing. But initially, it was, uh, yeah, it initial was uh, equal distances. Yeah, I think it was equal distances. But it doesn't matter. I mean, you can put, well, unless you want to wait even longer and you put them all them together like this, then you have to wait a long. So you just put a convenient initial condition. Mm? Uh, so they eventually they exclude one another. So they will just come back to what I showed you. No, no mortality here. All clear? So, uh, now, um, yeah, as I said, you know, this is a big stochastic simulation where it's not too horrible because there are just there is the active scent time as a parameter and there is a density, well, and then there is the way they move. So it's a quite a neat simulation to do, but still, <laughs> when, you put in a, when you just put 25 animals, then you have to keep track of the scent profile. It's taking a lot of memory. So uh, if you have data and you want to uh, actually look at data and try to extract parameters, then you need to simplify the model. It's inevitable. And so the way we approach the problem is, in some sense, we are help by knowing what exclusion process what to expect because of the exclusion process of the territory. So, um, and of course, e you want to simplify the model. And what you do first, you look at the 1D problem. I know that in some cases, some ecologists would just laugh about the fact that you're talking about 1D. But this is what you do just to understand things. And then you go to 2D, and this is what we did. So, and the 1D problem, to make it even simpler, you know, the 1D problem is this one. You have these random walkers moving. And then they deposit scent. And what I'm representing here is actually the extremum of their scent profile. And, uh, and this is the fact that this actually is moving is because if they don't rescent, you know, that would eventually have moved. So you have a set of n, I mean, in principle, an infinite number uh, that are on a line. And they interact by excluding one another as soon as they find the foreign scent. So this, what will happen is you have these, they move. And you can also create gaps between the two. I mean, it's not, you've seen the white spaces when you create gaps between two territories. And then they keep moving up. So there is a tendency, of course, you know, uh, as you have random walkers, it tends to fill the space. So there is a tendency of pushing, you know, against the neighbor territorial boundary. But, uh, but this would happen. So, so the simplest is therefore to reduce this even further. And rather than having n on a line, you just put 2 on a circle, which is exactly equivalent. Hmm? So this is what we did. So you go from that to that. And this is periodic boundary. Hmm? Since a random work you can do. And now you study the system. So you do simulation of that. And now we're going to do the analytics of that. So, <clears throat> so the first important thing that I wanted to show you is that you remember when I was telling you about this uh, rodent in Portal, Arizona? Now, as you do that simulation with those two individuals on the circle, I'm plotting here the mean square displacement, the same as I showed you in the Portal data, versus time. And indeed, you think, well, these are random workers. So, oh, I, I, yeah, I forgot. There was MSD, which was linear for a random worker. And then until you reach the boundaries, it's as if you are in unconstrained motion. So there is no boundary. You haven't felt the boundary. So this, well, just trust me, in this scale, you don't see. I mean, just trust me. This is linear, actually, indeed. 
This is coming from the simulation of these two D on a circle. Eh? But then up, up to some point, then it starts saturating. But it doesn't really saturate. Because indeed, the fluctuation of the boundaries becomes important. And in fact, it's. And what would it saturate to? I mean, what is the time dependence here? As I told you, in 1D exclusion process, a long time to have a mean square space with square root of time. You can try to fit. And indeed, you get a square root of time there. I mean, just trust me on that one also. But this is a square root of time dependence. So what you're actually seeing in this simulation for these two animals is that you have an animal. This animal are scenting. And they move diffusively up to a certain time. And then eventually, what you pick up is the movement of the box, which is not fixed if you're on the centroid of the box, which is, you know, remember this fluctuation you can divide into this, which are separation distance, and this. Eh? So what you pick up is actually the centroid movement, which is random because it's fluctuating. The system is stochastic, eh? but it's square root of time. Now here, what I plot here is if you just, you've seen the, uh, you've seen here, if you worry about when two territory boundaries are closed, which you may call it border, because they could be separated. But when they're closed, you track the statistics of that, and you calculate the mean square displacement of that. And so this is what is plot here. And that clearly is square root of time. Then you can see it's a sort of a square root. Hmm? It's not linear. Uh, now, of course, the coefficient here is very different. And this is a whole, if you want, uh, collective aspect and where, what, on what does it depend and it clearly will depend on the active send time and so on and I'll tell you more but so these are the boundaries which have the square root of time dependence and this you pick up from here also the square root of time dependence with a different coefficient. Lucas, shouldn't the boundaries start with the uh, interaction point? Because there are actually no boundaries before they really meet. Yeah, yeah, this is again you, you, you run it because you know it's in this 1D case this was uh, similar to the uh, initial condition question, no? You just have one here, one here, no send. Then you just w wait and wait and wait, and then boom, suddenly you start measuring. Mm -hmm. So you wait for a certain profile to be there, and then you start measuring. Yes? When you relate to the kangaroo at the data set, you have a hidden assumption that they have a territory. What if they are not territorial and they have congruences, but they could have overlap? That yeah. So. Uh, yeah, this, I would love to chat to you about this is, you know, what we have gone beyond here now is that you assume that the animal, as they encounter a foreign scent, they have a probability, I mean, it's not complete, for, it's not certain retreat. They could actually, oh, okay, let me go forward. Eh? So you have, a, you have a parameter there. And so, that, and so as you use that parameter, then, of course, automatically you're going to create the core areas and the shared areas. So, so the, I mean, their degree of... Uh, Boldness, I would say, yeah. So that depends on that parameter. So you can create indeed that. And so that, this is what we are doing at the moment. We are trying to ask the question, when, I mean, why are you, we want to be territorial? So it has to do all with encounter. There are interesting uh, minimum that generates there about the encounter of these animals in there, which are totally unexpected. And so. But yes, you're right. So e indeed, you can generate uh, overlap. These are, I mean, there are two different types of overlap because remember, as you, measure home range, you're integrating over time. So also, if you're territorial, if you measure over time, you're going to have overlap. So, you know, if the box is moving, so then you're going to find yourself where others have been, but only in the past. At each instance time, they're excluding one another, but integrating over time, they actually have an overlap. So you can have an overlap from full territorial exclusion, but you can also have an overlap when you have a probability of not just retreat, not, not a certain of retreat when you find a front center. So, um, so okay, I can't tell you too much about the kangaroo because you know I have to go back to that data and understand a bit more about those uh, rodents. But uh, so you're saying they are just uh, they're not really territorial. Well, I don't know what species it was, but from one species that I they're, studied, yeah. I could see that uh, you know you put the sea train and observe them several individuals coming to the sea. So they yeah. So I forgot it was, this data was the Dipodomis or, uh, or the Maria Mai, I forgot. One of the two is more territorial, I forgot now, but yeah, so. But you're right, yeah, so you have to be careful which, uh, you know, you see, I'm not a biologist, I don't even write the species that I'm plotting, no? so sorry, but this is. <laughs> okay, so, um, 
Everything is clear here? So now this is over time. Now I'm going to give you a snapshot uh, at this time here of the probability function associated with those, with the, the individuals and the boundaries. And so at this time, I can plot uh, the probability function. Remember that the mean square displacement is some sort of measure of the width of your probability function. Tomorrow, you'll under, tomorrow this afternoon, you'll understand everything about that. But so if I measure this width, it's somehow related. I mean, there is some correcting factor here, but it's related to that. So either of these two animals, you can plot it like this. And then if you measure the width of that, it's going to be this one. And of course, it's smaller than this. This is the width, if you want. Yeah. So and what happens is that you know, what this is indicating, then eventually, this keeps getting larger and larger. Because you keep going an anywhere, eventually you'll be all over space. So this has to do with this. And be careful when you integrate over time. You know, eventually, you'll be, you'll, be, you'll be observed to, be, to have been anywhere in space, unless you have a real constraint. So in this model, clearly, in this way we've done it, that's what happens. So, and then it has this characteristic kind of flat top shape, as you would expect. No? So you have, the point is that if you actually have like a glass wall, when you find the foreign scent, this is what you would expect. No? You would expect something like this. And this tapering here has to do with the fluctuation of the boundaries, which are presented you know, in this case by the probability function here. Oh, because there is the left and the right boundary. Yeah, these are one animal, and then the other one has periodic boundary condition. It comes back here, and then you have two boundaries, which is when two territorial borders meet, which, you know, the statistics are Gaussian with, with a width, which increases as square root of time rather than linear in time. And this is what you have here. So it's plotted versus space, and that's your probability distribution. Right, the sand, I mean, this, the sand boundary or the animal. You clear? The, say again? No, this, these are the borders. This is, as I said, you know, when, when the two territorial boundaries, uh, boundaries meet, This is the so, uh, so this is the probability. So you know when you have a stochastic process, you have a probability density function, which means given a variable, let's say position x in this case is position x, of where the territory boundary is, I can plot the probability distribution, which changes over time. Now, I'm plotting at a specific time now, which is this one. And as I plot it, then I have. You know, well, that's what you would expect. You have some sort of peak uh, around where you started from in general. And so this is, you know, it happens that when I started, uh, when I started from here, it was probably, it was this point, I mean, the peak here, and then it spreads. Because over time, the probability of you being away from where you started from is getting smaller and smaller. Huh? Yes, also. I, I, I know that you haven't understood, but that, okay, you'll ask me later, but. Oh, yeah, yes. Good. Very good. My, my, my question was that are these boundary points are we actually just doing a random walk? Or is there some kind of advective component? Let's no. say that you know, in territory of the other animal gets very small compared to the other. Is there then a bias component? Uh, no. Uh, so they are doing a, a random walk. They're doing a random walk. So, but it's a sub diffusive because it's a, 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 as a result of exclusion. Now, the specific territorial boundaries. So this is the borders. Eh? The borders, which is when they meet. Uh, so the specific territorial boundaries, it's actually a sort of a vection because uh, the, it's generated by the extreme statistics of the random walker. And so that, I mean, you, a, a random walker tend to um, increase, I mean, to fill the space. So there is a sort of a vection there. But, the so, but then you have the vection of the other one. So that, I mean, essentially get canceled. So you get the, the, the dynamics of the border, which is actually a random one. Sure, 
sure, but it, what, what I'm after is whether there's some kind of asymmetry. If, if it's just by random, it happens so that the other animal has a much bigger territory than the other one. So Correct. That's what I mean. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there is that, there is that bias, yeah. because, yeah, but yeah, there is that bias. But uh, as you look, you know, for example, maybe you can see here, for, on this simulation, you see the here, which is slightly different than that. Because this is actually from the simulation. So that's, if you want, it just happened, uh, I mean, as we started to measuring things, that that's, that was this initial condition that to do, someone was larger than the other one. Okay. Luca, maybe I give some background. Uh, random walk give, uh, give rise to, uh, simple diffusion, which is described by the Gaussian distribution, okay? The normal distribution that you, you always see is generated by random walk. And so we should expect a, a, a normal a Gaussian distribution, you know, the bell shape, the very uh, nice one, but what you see here is that it's more fluffy curvy, right? There's no, there's, there's much more in the middle, right? In the middle value, than, than should be if you would expect from a Gaussian distribution, and much le less in the shoulders and, and in the tail. So this is what is called sub-diffusion, okay? They are not free to go anywhere. They encounter the boundaries, and they, they go back. So this gives rise to this kind of... So what you really need to do when you look at that is to think what should be the, the now model. Okay. The null model is a Gaussian distribution, and this is not a Gaussian distribution. Still unclear? You can ask me later. Eh? I think you're still unclear, eh? correct? Yeah, OK. So let me move on, and then I'll, I mean, I'll be happy to answer your question. So um, uh, so one interesting thing that, again, out of the simulation of these two 1D territorial random walker is that now fundamentally as I said you have this active sentence that controls this fluctuation and what is the other important aspect it's the dynamics of the animal to reach these points in this case these are the borders if you want that you have just sent you know it's important to maintain the territory that you move back to the left boundaries and then again, you move back to the right boundary so that you maintain your territory. So, and you know, as you see you know, in the 2D simulation, you see a lot of white space in the fast dynamics situation. No? It's because the active sentence was too small. So the animal doesn't have the time to reach the left boundary and come back because you know, it's too short, the AS. Hmm. So, and uh, what was interesting, a sort of general feature of this model, which yeah, eventually you understand, is that if you plot, now what is K and what is D, so this is a diffusive constant, the diffusion constant of the animal. And this is a diffusion constant of the border. Remember, if I go back here, the diffusion constant of the animal, the diffusion constant of the border. Uh, what is it? So even if it's a sub-diffusing Gaussian, so it spreads with the square root of time, there is a coefficient here I mean, that is going to give you a distance squared eh, value. So that coefficient is sub-diffusion coefficient. And also on this one, what spreads, there is a coefficient there, which is diffusion constant. Even the shape is very peculiar. So those are the two coefficients. So for the animal is D, diffusion coefficient. And for, um, and for this um, is actually K. So there is the analytics. I mean, I can show you later. Yeah. When they're so separate. Yeah. yeah. So there is a proportion of the time that, that the, the diffusion there is no the correct. diffusion is not continuous. Correct, correct, correct. So, so we how do you define no no, you don't define it. So 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 you what so you simply don't I mean you don't, don't sample that point. It's it's uh, sample a different it's as simple as that. Yeah. Okay. So and so this is what I'm plotting here in a log scale, k over d. And so that gives you an idea of the ratio, the movement rate between the, the borders, so this fluctuation, and the animal, no? which is, uh, if you want, you have only to think, you know, remember the border, you have to think about something slow because it's exclusion. On the other hand, the animal, you can think about something fa relatively, even if it's a random walk, okay, relatively fast that is moving inside. So you make the ratio of these two, 
And it also falls quite nicely on, on this linear plot down here. So there is an exponential dependence on what? It turns out it depends exponentially on the relation between the active send time and what we define the boundary return time, which is precisely, if you have the two borders, the time to, you know, you, this would be represent a random worker that moves, sent back, and then goes back. Because you may notice that if I'm here, I sent, then I don't want this to be taken over by the neighbor, so I have to be quick enough to go back and resent it. Well, I don't want also the other one. So this is the, uh, what we define the boundary return time. Yeah, it's it actually it's we. I mean, it's it's twice what we call the first passage time. Okay, so let me. So again, you will learn from me about first passage time, which are very important. If you have, if you, if you want to maintain this territory, and I start here. So I need to move, sent this side. Now I've sent it. Huh? And then this, I start, and I have to return here by the time which is the active send time. This is in, on 1D. But yeah. on 2D, 2D you, have a, you have a diffusive time. You're right. So 2D is a bit more complicated. That's why I'm trying to explain here. But, but uh, this time is not constant. Very good. So the first pass of time is a random variable as, as well. That's the mean time. Very good. So, so this is, if you want, you will, you will learn about this fundamental first passage time, which is a time for which some process occur. And when it happens, that's it. I mean, everything stops in some sense. In the simulation, what you do, you just stop if you want. Huh? Because that's, as you get there for the first time, it's an important thing. Notice that here, as you get there and you resent, it's like, and now, I mean, you reset the clock. Hmm? So, you know, a lot of threshold phenomena, and if you're in physics or biology, maybe biologists don't talk about first passage time, but it's first passage, you know, the first time you get somewhere, that's what counts. So this is clearly one of those situations. So uh, do you remember that I was changing by just a factor of two in 2D, the active send time, and then from just this kind of more biological situation, you get to this very kind of chaotic, I mean, it's not really chaotic in the sense of chaotic system, but very mm, uh, highly moving territories, lots of white space. And it was just a factor of two, the active and time. So this is already we got an intuition why it was happening, because you have an exponential dependency. Remember, this is a log scale. So I changed by just a factor of two, you get you know, e to the minus two difference. Mm -hmm. So. Um, and you know, why is it they, they, they fall onto the same uh, uh, line because of the density? Well, you know, the density, if you have, you have to think about, well, now I'm just putting more than one. On average, what would you expect to be the territory size? The inverse of the population density. That's on average. Eh? Of course, they are flotating, but that's what you expect on average. Or well, that's what they would tend on average to. So if you, if you change density, so everything rescale because now the active send time, now what I just told you here, and now you suddenly you are here. I mean, huh? But I mean, you're just rescaling the, the space. So it turns out that you know, they fall nicely here. So uh, how much time, or do you, are you keeping track of me? Maybe I'm just going over. Well, 11.40. So sh should I, let's see, what? Continue until 12. Until 12? So uh, 15, 15 minutes. OK, sorry. Um, now, so, uh, so how do you actually understand this curve pre more precisely, more quantitatively? Well, you do a first pass calculation. Uh, let, me, let me just say that you do the calculation. There is a way to. So there is a first part. If you have a random variable, you have a distribution of that variable. And you can show that a long time this first pass variable depends on L is the average size, which is the inverse of population density. So it has this dependence a long time. It's an exponential dependence. And then you can just, the K so is directly proportional to 1 minus the integral 
of that first partial distribution up to a time TAS. So then you do your, int your, in your integral, and then you're going to have an exponential TAS up here. Voila. So that's why you have this exponential. I mean, I don't want to, you to understand precisely, but just to, to show you that you can get that. So now, analyze the reduced model. So, uh, so again, this is a collective kind of process. And the way you want to reduce is just you focus on the individual. One individual, you just focus. And then typically what you do in physics, you, you focus on one. And then the rest is you take into account the rest as much as, I mean, in the best way possible. But you have to do approximations. So that's what people talk about, many body to one body reduction. Now, if you have the right understanding of the system, you know what kind of approximation to apply and in what regime that will be valid for the real full simulation. So this is a classical many to one body reduction. So remember now the process is actually the probability. You focus on one. So you have a position of this animal, x, this vector. I mean, if you want, we, can, we can do it in 2D, but I'll just show you in 1D. This is a left and right border, if you want. And then over time. So this is the probability of occupation, or if you want probability density function, of the variable x and l, which are random variable both, versus time. Now, when I, when I tell you about probability function, do you, do you actually have some doubts of what I'm saying? Or OK, I see. Uh, OK, I'll explain you. Uh, well, this afternoon. X and L should be related because they are affected. Correct, correct, yes. Le the next, <laughs> let me just press the button here. <laughs> so so uh, I'll tell you this afternoon um, maybe about probability function. Mm -hmm. So there it is, your relation. Uh, well, forget about algebraic approximation. This is always true with an equal sign. That given a probability x, l, a time, it's also equal. This is w stands for walker. Hmm? So the probability of the walker, position x, time, given l, multiplied by the probability q of having l as function of time. So this is always true with an equal sign. Now, where is the approximation? That's what we call the Adabati approximation. Remember I was telling you that these borders are very slowly moving. Mm? And then the animal, relatively speaking, even if it's a random walker, is actually fast compared to this movement, just because this, there is exclusion. So that's why there is this sign here, which is not the exact equal sign. So you treat the actual system as given by the product. You approximate given by the product of these two. Now, but where is it? So. I mean, again, if you want, where is it that you can use this adiabatic? Because in some sense, you have to make the many to one body reduction. Remember, this movement is slow, but it depends on the whole x and l, no? And all the others. So, but there is one information that you know. This tends always to go towards this inverse of the relation density. You know, there is a tendency for them to go there. And Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean uh, for the animal, the boundaries are stable. Well, I mean, yes, yeah. This is why, correct. I mean, now, now, let, me let me show you, yeah. So, but remember, before you do that, I mean, in the sense, this is, when you write this is, forget about this one. This is what exactly you are saying. For a given L, I can just talk about the probability of the animal being a position X at time T. G give me L, uh, then I, I can. And this is exactly what you just said. Now, the point is that, this, you know, Q of LT, eh, you have to take that into account. But, but, I mean, what governs this, it depends, if you want, I mean, it depends on L in the real simulation. No? But what you're saying is that Q is very small in comparison. No, the probability is not necessarily very small. No, this is a probability. You're not talking about. The yeah, but this, you're talking about, this is a probability function. Eh? So the probability goes, if you integrate over all values of L, that's is, is one. And this is if you integrate over a value of X, that's one. So it's, I mean, there's nothing to do small or large. So it's a time scale, which is small or large, which is the actual movement. So 
So what you do, essentially, you have this information, which is you have this boundary that are moving, but they always tend to this inverse of the population density. There's this tendency, because you know, if you, if you had suddenly you have something which is larger than the, this inverse of the population density, then the neighbors will push farther and more and more, and then eventually you return there, and the vice versa if you are smaller. So this is it's, it's a phenomenological approach. Eh? So I just decided to put a spring between these two. Remember, I'm focusing on one animal, and then I have to take into account the interaction with all the rest. So how do I do it? Well, I just do it in this way. So I put a spring, and just no, just one, because I'm focusing on one. If I put a series, I haven't re redux, re uh, reduced the many to one body. I'm just reducing to one. So I put the spring, so that it tends to do that. And so eventually, that's why you have this symbol here. Because this is the one simplified by taking into account the interaction with all the other animals, if you want, and all the other boundaries by putting the spring. Otherwise, this would be correct. But then the dynamics of this is simplified by just thinking about this. Sorry? Yeah, w I mean, two boundaries for one animal. And then in 2D, you have to be a little bit more careful because you have, I mean, you have to assume some geometry there. You either think about Cartesian or circular geometry, no? Well, ideally, we want to simulate all animals in this look here, but we want to simplify, okay, to reduce the dimension of this complexity. And what Luca is doing here is to take the dynamics of the boundary which are limited by the den or determined by the density as, as uh, reflecting all individuals, okay? So you don't need to simulate all individuals. You just need to make this assumption that it will converge to one over density. This is the right one. And then you only need to, to look at one individual. But, but keep in mind that you still have a time dependence on this, huh? Because again, you want to allow that to be a dynamics where things do that eh, for the boundaries. I mean, I, if you don't do that, you don't get what you see in the simulation. Anyway, so, so now, don't worry. I mean, I just want to show you. So what you write is a focal Planck equation for the boundaries. This is a Q. I mean, you don't have to understand all this. But it's two variables, left and right boundaries. And this is the part that takes into account the spring, the difference between L2 and minus L1 is equal to, tends to, the 1 over the inverse of the population density, which is 1 over L. Hmm? So the, the density is a 1 over L. Hmm? But I mean, yeah, five minutes. Good, good. Thanks. Um, anyway, um, so you can solve that problem. Now, what about the worker? Well, remember, I, this should be WXT, com, I mean, given L. Eh? I just simplify the notation. The worker is, you all know, in continuous space, it's a diffusion equation. So, but there is one difference, it's confined. So you have a reflecting boundary, and the boundary, what we call the borders. So that's why at the derivative, so it's no flux, so nothing gets out. So the, f the derivative of that, at position right boundary and left boundary, the, it has to be equal to zero. So that changes completely the problem compared to, you know, if you don't have this one. So here you solve it, you get a Gaussian, here you get infinite series solution, if you put that into account. And you learn how to use this infinite series. For me, when you have movement in confined space, you need to understand that. So I mean, I just show you that uh, this is a solution. It's simple. OK, for a mathematician, it's simple if you want. But um, that's your infinite series, where n is the index, which is here, 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 and there. But essentially, in time, is an exponential. So we learn about that. And so what you do, well, now, remember that you have to compute. We were interested in what? In looking at the animals. Eh? Remember the plots? We had the plot, which were actually the main square displacement of the animal, which was doing this. And keep going as square root of time eh? from the simulation of the two animals. You remember? And then, and then the boundaries, oh, sorry, the borders, which is when two boundaries meet, was something which was you know, uh, some square root of time. No? Well, OK, I would, sorry, guys. So let me just so something like this, huh? where both this one and this one were square root of time with different constants. 
So of course, remember that now we have a probability in the simplified model of the having a position x, the right border at position L2, the left border at position L1. These are all random variable at time t. So the mean square displacement of the animal, just the animal, is x squared. You'll understand this afternoon when I talk about moments of distribution. That's the mean square, so it's a second moment. You integrate over the possible values, since it's confined between L1 and L2. And then, for you know, remember, this is a marginal. It's associated with the, you're just looking at the animal. You don't care what the boundaries are. So you have to integrate over the other degrees of freedom, which is L1 and L2. And so that's why you have these two additional integral. And that's, you get, that's why you have a double brackets here. So this would mean the average. Now you have two because you take into account, I mean, the average over L1 and L2. It's just a symbol that I use. And now, surprise, surprise, I plot it. OK, forget about, oh, voila. Now you plot the animal, which you see it's not saturating. And you trust me, it goes exactly the square root of time. And this is the boundaries that goes the square root of time. And you can see now, now you can go in and, and ask the question, what is that determines the square root of times? So the model was phenomenological. We have a diffusion constant of the borders, which was k. So, and, and so that's this integral of this function, phi of s, which, let me just tell you, it has to do with the position of the centroid of these territories as they keep moving. So precisely as I was telling you at the beginning of the lecture, is that you would expect this mean square space displacement to keep increasing over time if the box where you are contained keeps moving and going around. This is precisely this term. So now you get, so what is the advantage of doing all of this? Now you have a quantitative grip on your understanding. Hmm? So rather than, you know, if you want the first half of the lecture, you might have understood everything just by me telling you. But then the, what you want to always do is you have, a, you know, you have to grab it and you know, now I'm going to do something with this. So you need this reduction because now you can go to the data and extract values of K, extract value of TAS and so on, which I don't have time to tell you now because I think it's time is over. Uh, so there is a whole 2D thing that we can do on this precise uh, let me just skip this one. Then I can't tell you about this. Uh, what I want to tell you, um, where is it? Sorry. Oh, yes. So coming back to biology, so there was an interesting 1930, what was it? 1934, yes. James Huxley was a famous biologist who was actually observed for the first time in a bird population. This was a good population that he talked about the deformation of these territories like elastic disks. I mean, you should read that paper. It's very interesting. You know, this is 1930 biology. But, uh, and, uh, you know, it's just a piece of paper. You were just sitting there and you know, drawing this uh, position and so on. So, so there was an hypothesis. Yeah? And, uh, and I remember, I discovered this just after having done all the work and uh, talking about, you know, springs and so on, putting, you know, I said, OK, this is always phenomenological. But actually, I just found out about this hypothesis, which was used in the 30s and 40s, but then not so much anymore. So, so apparently, so what we have found, it was you know, a, a quantitative explanation of this hypothesis. Uh, now, let me, what I want to tell you about this elasticity uh, is just to come back. Sorry, or give me just two minutes. This is the last slide. So, um, so now, once you have a model, well, you want to make it useful. Eh? So one of the interest here was indeed from Stephen Harris. He was interested in finding out uh, the change of behavior of these foxes when the density population was high before this manger episodic and afterward, just afterwards. So, and so now you have a model, the reduced model in 2D, if you haven't seen it. And then you go in and you measure the change in the parameters. You just fit the model. You do maximum likelihood fitting, and then you fit your model. And you get the parameters out. And again, what diffusion constant of the animal, diffusion constant of the boundary, uh, the borders, and so on and so forth. And so this is what you get. So this is the pre mange and post mange Now, of course, the, after the mange episodic, so the population was decimated. So you have suddenly a drop in population. So then, of course, the average territory size should increase. Well, that's what you would expect, no? And in fact, uh, you know, notice the change. Huh? So, notice, I mean, the error bars are small here because you do maximum likelihood. Hmm? 
So I know from Otso we learn a bit about maximum likelihood or, or Bayesian inference, something similar. But uh, um, so what I want to tell you, so these are, this is a correlation time has to do with the turning angle distribution, which surprisingly enough, more or less remain the same. You know, you would expect that as you go into new uncharted territories, animals would tend to actually, you know, move a little bit cautious, you know, and make, you know, turning more because they want to explore. No? And it didn't change that much. That was a real surprise. But um, no, what changed a lot, on the other hand, is this, you know, when you have a factor of 10 change, in biology is a big number. Huh? So this was that K factor that I was telling you about, which measured, I mean, this boundary movement rate associated with that. A change by, the of, by 10, by a factor of 10. And, and notice, of course, they start to move quicker because they need to cover a bigger area if they want to exclude the, 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 the neighbors. So that is understandable. And uh, now, what was the most interesting was this change. Now, do you remember there is an active same time, which in the model has been always a parameter. But of course, you can extract, once you have a model, a mechanistic model, you can extract from the data. So you fit the, redu the reduced 2D model, and you get five days pre-mange and 3.4 days post-mange. So apparently, the mange episodic didn't change the way they were sending. So something is telling you that behaviorally, they're not just smelling the scent, they also listen somehow. So somehow they were prepared to move, you know, the active scent times, the amount of time the animal waits to, to go into the territory, the foreign territory. Remember the model, how it was? If I find a foreign scent, which is of a time old of five days, then until it's less than five days, I don't go beyond this foreign scent. Yes, let me just finish. On the other hand, if it's less, then you move quicker into the foreign territory. So, but, you know, the chemicals in the scent are the same. But maybe the concentration is not the same. Maybe no, but the, the population density can decrease uh, significantly in just collecting uh, scent samples. Yeah, okay. I mean, you can also have that explanation. Okay. I mean, again, nobody has done the actual experiment, so you're right. But uh, apparently, uh, foxes also tend to has auditory cues. So, I mean, you know, the, the distance is such that they could actually understand there is someone nearby. So if the animal was dead, and rather than actually going necessarily next to the boundary to find the foreign scent, they could actually also rely on this. And so therefore, they somehow, you know, if you want, you use a model and you find out that um, you do a fit. So just to tell you that, uh, even if it's a reduced model, you can use, make a fit, and in some sense you can say, oh, I would need to take into account auditory cues. It's true, I mean, you would have to make a super model and so on. But you don't need to, because this is sophisticated enough to actually extract information and understand the behavioral change of these foxes as the population was a sudden decline. So let me stop here, uh, uh, otherwise people will starve. Uh, okay, so what did I tell you today? Uh, well, okay, so. Uh, let me just, uh, so uh, I try to tell you that, uh, so we talk about this stochastic simulation of um, interacting animals, social interacting animals. So we went from the microscopic to the macroscopic formation of territories. So, and, and I show you how it, they emerge dynamically. And then, well, I show you that the conspecific avo avoidance makes this uh, territory undergo exclusion. I didn't tell you about this, I didn't have the time. And then I just, briefly mention about, you know, uh, the test on the, fo on the Fox's data. So there is a series of pair papers where all this is written. Uh, so this is the last one where we discuss the, the biological implication when we did this fit to the data. And the others are published. And, um, and this was the original one where we put out the territorial and the model. Well, thank you.